come to the first chapter of the book of Exodus. Actually, we'll be several uh, places in Scripture from uh, the book of Genesis through the book of Acts. So it's not uh, what we necessarily would call an exegetical sermon, which means we take one passage and read out from it. But rather, it is an overview of an experience in the Scripture that I'm today calling the Egypt experience. And it is part of this uh, series, number eight out of this series, of 30 things that you need to know if you claim to know your Bible. And I hope that you do uh, claim to know your Bible, or you at least say, well, I'd like to claim to know my Bible. And I want to say, if you claim to know your Bible, you ought at least be able to carry on a conversation about these 30 things. Otherwise, your claim to know your Bible is kind of like Bernie Sanders' claim to fix the economy. Uh, And uh, it's uh, just not all going to work and go through there. So that was uh, politics, and it was all totally free. And I uh, give no apologies. But nonetheless, uh, I, I want to remind you, as I did uh, and have done several times in this series, as now we're on number eight of these 30 things, that these sermons are a little different than the average uh, uh, sermon menu that's given uh, when you go to a sermon and they put the, uh, excuse me, you go to a church and they put the, the meal, the, uh, the, 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 the meal of the word out there. We so much are used to application-based sermons that uh, if, uh, if, if you don't know me, you might be expecting, well, the Egypt experience. And here Denise just talked about going through the valley. And so we're going to carry all this over and I'm going to give some application about what to do when you're in your Egypt. Uh, But I'm not going to do that. Because uh, truth is, the Egypt experience, uh, I've never been through, and I'm not going through. The Americans have never been through, and they're not going through. It's really uh, an experience that was unique in time and place to the Hebrew people some uh, 4,000 years ago. And uh, and so what I give to you today is an information-based sermon so that you can go away and say, hey, I know my Bible, at least eight things out of my Bible, if you've been with us along through uh, this series. And uh, we'll talk about the Egypt experience experience today. Now next week is going to be uh, in, the, in the same neighborhood because we're going to talk about Passover, which of course was part of the Egypt experience. But three things really I want to uh, point out in this Egypt experience, and that is uh, how, many, how many went down there and how long they were there, and then how God used the time there to raise up a leader, of course, whom we all know as Moses. And uh, if you are going to uh, carry on a conversation about your Bible, you'll need to know about these things. Now, uh, in, in one sense, a question like, how many Israelites went to Egypt to begin the Egypt experience? Almost <laughs> sounds like, excuse me, I've got a little half a voice this week, but it almost sounds like a trivia question, doesn't it? And the, the way we've been, again, trained up in the modern church is, you don't need to know any of that. I mean, what does it really matter? If it was 10 people or 100 people or 1,000 people, who cares, right? They, the fact is they got there and, and God brought them out. Now, in the, in the most general sense, that might be true. The problem is that you and I have a Bible, and this Bible we call the Word of God. The Word of God, that's a collective uh, uh, term for all 66 books here, right? But the Word of God, when you open it up, it's made up of what? Words, that's right. You see, there's no pictures in here. Uh, Some Bibles have pictures, but uh, the, the, the Word of God really is, it's words. And I happen to believe, and uh, hopefully teach you to believe, that every one of those words is inspired of God. It is breathed of God. And as it says in the New Testament, it is profitable for doctrine and correction and training in righteousness and righteousness. And this list of things is given in 2 Timothy. Now, if we really believe that every word came from God, which word is just trivia? <laughs> See, we can't really put it aside like that, can we? So we, we have to come down and say, well, I want to know my Bible. And if I want to know my Bible, then I need to know, for example, what does the Bible say about how many people went down to Israel? Now, the, uh, to Egypt, excuse me. The reason that I uh, uh, bring this up, second reason that I bring this up, not only because it's included in the Bible, but a second reason I bring this up is this and the next matter are matters in which skeptics come and say, well, that Bible is full of contradictions and errors. Errors. 
And if you haven't been uh, confronted and taught those contradictions and errors, and someone points this passage versus that passage, you might just scratch your head, as I've done before, obviously, and come to the point of saying, well, by golly, I don't know. I, maybe the Bible is full of errors. Now, again, and I mentioned this, I believe it was even last week, we used to live in a society which had a foundation of Judeo-Christian values, and so we were okay just saying, well, I don't understand it, but I just take it in faith. And, and that was okay back in that society. But we don't live in that world, do we, anymore? Uh, we live in a world in which, uh, in which young people especially are saying, well, you can swallow that pill if you want to, but I want to see it, touch it, feel it with my own eyes. I want there to be something logical that goes together. So a young person comes and they say, well, here it says 66 people went down. Here it says 70 people went down. Here it says 75 people went down. That's only a difference of what, nine people? I never was very good at math. But uh, it, 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 how, how do you say that the Bible is the inerrant word of God when you've got a discrepancy of nine people? Somewhere we've got to have an answer other than, well, just take it in faith. Uh, or, well, that part doesn't really matter. Uh, because that becomes a very slippery slope, doesn't it? Which other parts don't uh, really matter. So how many Israelites went down to uh, Egypt? This is the uh, question. And let's look at a few uh, scriptures. First of all, let's go to Genesis, the 46th chapter. And uh, verse 26, and we see the first time there is indication of a number of people who are making their way down to Egypt. Of course, they have been in uh, the land that was promised to Abraham, but Abraham, Isaac, and now Jacob have never uh, really inherited or possessed that land. They've lived as sojourners there. And... Uh, uh, then a famine comes and uh, they leave the land that they have been promised, leave it really uh, unfaithfully. But in, in Genesis chapter 46, verse 26, it says, All the souls that came with Jacob into Egypt, which came out of his loins, besides Jacob's sons, wives, all the souls were threescore and six. That's King James for 66, right? So, all of them there were, were three score and six, or 66. Now, with that uh, in mind, uh, turn over, or, or just move one verse, actually. Uh, in, in verse 27, it says, And the sons of Egypt, which were born with him in Egypt, were two souls. All the souls of the house of Jacob, which came into Egypt, were three score and ten. That happens to be 70. So, that one, honestly, is pretty easy to, uh, to, to, to discern because it tells us what the difference is between 66 and 70. And just in case you didn't get it, uh, there were uh, 66 that it says, very specifically, the souls that came into Egypt, with, which, which uh, came out of his loins. Those are two key words. And uh, the souls, first of all, that came into Egypt. Now, you remember that Joseph didn't go in that group, did he? Joseph came into Egypt when his brothers sold him into slavery. So, of course, Joseph is not counted in the 66 because he didn't come into Egypt with all those souls who went down there with Jacob. Now, that's one key. So we have Joseph, but Joseph also had two sons. His sons were named Manasseh, Ephraim and Manasseh. Uh, and uh, those two sons, of course, they didn't go down. They were born in Egypt. So there's three. So that's 66, 67, 68, 69. But we end up with 70. Not his wife. But hang on, we'll get the wives in later. <laughs> Actually, again, you have to read very closely, uh, and the answer is uh, right there in front of you. It says, in, again in verse 26, all the souls that came with Jacob unto Egypt, which came out of his loins. Let me ask you a question. Did Jacob come out of Jacob's loins? No. So this obviously didn't include Jacob, but Jacob went down from Egypt. So 66, not including Jacob, jo uh, Joseph, Ephraim, Manasseh, and that's 67, 68, 69, and 70. And so we have that answer there. Now, uh, 
Uh, when uh, th that uh, particular uh, word of 70 is also found in Exodus chapter 1 verse 5 and Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 22 and uh, in Genesis uh, chapter 46 verse 27. So when you take it in Genesis it kind of explains it there but the other two times it doesn't explain it. You have to you know connect the dots and put it all together and say well how in the world do you end up with 70? And that's how you end up uh, there with 70. However I want you to turn to the New Testament and go to the 7th chapter chapter of Acts. And here we have the uh, fantastic sermon that Stephen is giving. And uh, just to uh, show you that uh, if you preach a fantastic sermon, then everyone will rise up and call you blessed. I would say that sermons, uh, Stephen's sermon was maybe one of the best that was ever preached in all of time. And they concluded that by stoning him, you remember. But Acts chapter 7, verse 14, Stephen is giving the history uh, of the Jewish people to his Jewish nation. And he, uh, he, he says in that history, he says, Then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him, and all his kindred threescore and fifteen souls. Now that happens to be seventy-five. Well, how do we account for seventy-five? Got to add in a few more, don't you? It's interesting. Uh, this is the most problematic one when you begin to look down into, uh, uh, into the commentaries and say, well, what, how in the world are they going to come up with that extra five people? They got to come up with the extra five people somewhere. And the majority of commentators actually, I think, get it wrong. Uh, have you noticed that's a common theme of mine? Uh, the majority of them will say, well, Jewish tradition tells us that Joseph had more sons than Ephraim and Manasseh. <laughs> and the truth is, maybe he did have more sons than Ephraim and Manasseh, I don't know. But to, to base it on Jewish tradition, I think I, I, I'm, I'm a skeptic who says, ah, I want more than, you know, maybe this is the case. I think the, uh, the, the simplest, as you really begin to study it in Scripture, however, and you begin to study closely, uh, and uh, th that's the way you ought to study Scripture, by the way, is closely. We, uh, we need to read the Bible like you would read a biology textbook if you are about to have a biology test. And would you read the biology textbook in light of the test, the forthcoming, would you read it in a devotional way? I don't know that you would ever read a biology book in a devotional way, would you? But uh, maybe we have a doctor here, maybe uh, two doctors, maybe they just love biology so much they read it on vacation. I don't know, you all, but uh, my, my hunch is not. But before a test, you would read it and all of that, and you would read it for the detail, for the specifics, for the information. Now, somewhere along the way, we taught people don't read the Bible that way. We taught people to read the Bible in a devotional way, or what do you, where do you see your life in it, or how does this apply to you, or what's God saying to you out of this. And uh, I don't want to discount all that completely, but I would say you're never going to get any of that if you don't take the Bible and say, I need to know the information. And to get the information, of course, really to make all this come together, all you have to do is read very closely. Again, in Acts chapter 7, verse 14, I want you to notice it says, Then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him and all his kindred. And all his kindred. Now, in the previous verses in Genesis, it had said those who came from his loins. Now, the, it happens to be, when you uh, read closely uh, the book of Genesis, it happens to be that Jacob, of course, had 12 sons. And of those uh, 12 sons, uh, uh, there were uh, two of the wives that had already died. And so if you go with all the family, then we've already counted the grandsons, we've already counted the sons, but those sons, all but two of them, took their wife down also. So if you go from 66 and add the nine, the nine wives that are left, guess what? You end up with 75. And it all works out just perfectly. So how many Israelites went from, uh, from what was to be the promised land, what was the promised land, hadn't been given, down to Egypt? The answer is 75, if you count the whole kindred that went, that took the journey, not those who were already there, but those who took the journey were 75. And the answer is clear. So now you know something about the Bible, don't you? 
The question then is, how long were they there? If you Google this, the answer is going to be 400 years. That's right. Uh, and of course, if you Google it, it's got to be right. <laughs> Let's be good Bereans and study the scripture. Now, you know, I started to be uh, kind, of, um, kind of mean this morning. Uh, every now and then I want to be mean. Do you? Uh, I started to be mean because I, I got together a bunch of quotes of uh, well-known preachers that you knew and uh, quotes of them saying that the children of Israel were in Egypt 400 years. And they're not hard to find, these quotes. I mean, you've said it, so I decided not to be too hard on them. Uh, <laughs> but the truth is, when you really look in the Bible, that's the wrong answer. I'll show you. Let's look in Genesis chapter 15, verse 13. And we begin to say, how long were they in Egypt? Everybody says it was 400 years. And if we were on uh, uh, playing a game of Trivial Pursuit, that would probably be the answer that is out there. But it is wrong. Genesis chapter 15, verse 13 says this. And he said to Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them. How long? 400 years. Signed, sealed, and delivered, right? It was 400 years. Uh, well, let's uh, turn to, for example, Exodus chapter 12. And remember, there's no contradictions in the Word of God, right? Uh, and I would, say, I would affirm that. There's no contradictions in the Word of God. But what do you do when you get to chapter 12, verse 40? And it says, Now the sojourning of the children of uh, Israel who dwelt in Egypt was, how long? 430 years. In fact, look at verse 41. It came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the selfsame day it came to pass, that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. So, they were down there how long? 430 years. Were they down there 400 years or were they down there 430 years? I know back in the day when everybody had Judeo-Christian values, we said, it doesn't matter, 400, 430 years, what difference does it make? They were down there uh, that, that uh, long. Well, uh, I, I uh, want you, if you have one of those handy little green strings, or that's not green, is it? Uh, orange strings. If you have a string, put it right there in Genesis, Exodus chapter 12, because I want us to come back. And let's go back to Acts chapter 13. Do you feel like you're in Bible drill today? Uh, Acts chapter 13, and uh, we'll read uh, beginning in verses uh, 16 through 20. And it would help if I had a... Uh, modern translation, which I don't because the King James differs here just a little bit as it does in Exodus 12. But Acts chapter 13, um, verse uh, 16 says, Paul stood up, beckoning with his hand, men of Israel, ye that fear God, give audience. The God of this people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people whom uh, exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt and with a high arm brought he them out of it and about the time of 40 years suffered he their, their manners in the wilderness and when he had destroyed uh, destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan he divided their land by lot to them, and he gave it to them. Now, those of you who aren't reading in the King James, go ahead and help me out here. Uh, it says he gave it to them uh, that all this took place for how long? 450. 400, about 450 years, it says. Now, it says about, uh, but it, all this took place about 450 years. Now, I want you to notice, however, that if, you're, uh, if, if you have a newer translation, you watch with your eyes as I read King James. Again, I'll begin in verse 19. It says, when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he divided their land to them by lot. And after he gave, after that, he gave unto them judges about the space of 450 years until Samuel the prophet. Now, the King James, that is, and the text that it is built upon, says the 450 years was the time period of what? The judges, that's right. 
They entered into the land of Canaan, took about seven years to do that, and then he gave them about 450 years of the period of Judges. That's the King James and probably the New King James. All the other translations actually use a different underlying text. It's called the critical text. It was put together by a committee, and uh, it, that's one of the reasons I use King James. I can't read it and understand it. I have to slow down, you know, but that's a good thing. Uh, and, uh, and yet it uses, I think, a better text. So the better text says uh, about uh, 450 years of, uh, of, uh, of the time of the judges. Now, uh, there's another question. You got that uh, string in, in uh, Genesis chapter 15, don't you? Or, no, we put it in Exodus chapter 12. Go back to Genesis chapter 15, which take your string to Gen Exodus 12 and then keep turning to the left. How's that? Nobody's confused yet, are you? Uh, Exodus, uh, good, uh, excuse me, Genesis chapter 15 Verse 16. Earlier we were in chapter 15 and we saw that it was going to be 400 years. And now, if I can find chapter 15, we are told in chapter 15, verse 16, it says, But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Now, obviously, that's in the middle of the context. But in the fourth generation, they shall come hither. Sounds poetic, doesn't it? Let me ask, who's they? It's Israel, the descendants of these uh, 75 people. They shall come hither. Where's hither? Here is the land of uh, the, the, the promised land. And they will come in what generation? The fourth generation. Does a generation typically last 100 years? Yeah, 40 years would be a little closer uh, uh, to it. And that's, a, that's a, one of those uh, numbers that is not really fixed, but 100 years is, uh, is a stretch to say uh, that uh, that would last. Now, to uh, show you this now, turn over, uh, uh, turn to the right to Exodus chapter 6. And let's uh, see these four generations in a way that uh, makes 400 years very problematic. Exodus chapter 6, beginning in verse 16, it says, these are the names of the sons of Levi. If you are Hebrew, we would pronounce it Levi, by the way. But these are the names of the sons of Levi. Now, Levi is, uh, it, it, do you remember Levi was one of the sons of who? Jacob. So Levi is counted in the 75. Levi was one of those who went from Israel to Egypt. He was that first generation to go down into Egypt. And it says then uh, that these are the sons of Levi, in verse 16, according to their generations. He had several sons. Here they are. Gershon and Kohath and Merari. By the way, Shelley and I found out this week that we're having a grandson on September the 7th. Uh, and we're not going to allow them to name our grandson Gershon, Kohath, or Merari. <laughs> but <laughs> nonetheless, here are the three sons. Now, Kohath is the one I want you to, to consider. It says the years of uh, the life of Levi were 137 years. The sons of Gershon are in verse 17. The sons of Kohath uh, in verse 18. This is what I want to look at. So Kohath's dad is who? Levi, just want to make sure you remember. Levi was the first generation. He had a son, Kohath. And Kohath then had a son, the sons of Kohath in verse 18, had a son named Amram. That's the only one out of those I'm really interested in you knowing because I can't pronounce the rest of them. So he had a son named Amram. Now jump down to verse 20. Amram, before you miss it, Amram, who was Amram's grandfather? Levi, that's right. Now, verse 20, Amram took him, Jochebed, his father's sister, to, to, to wife, and she bare him, who? Aaron. Aaron and Moses. So, Amram's grandfather was who? Was Levi. And Amram's son was who? Aaron and Moses. And Aaron and Moses happen to be the two guys that are going to what? They're going to lead us out. Now, that's the fulfillment, certainly, of the four generations. But how do you get Levi taking, uh, going, going down there, having uh, Co 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 what, Kohath, and then Amram, 
And then Moses and Aaron, you know, by the time they're 80 years old, they're headed out. That's hard to stretch that 400 years. In fact, with their lifetimes, I can tell you it doesn't stretch 400 years. In fact, it doesn't really need to stretch 400 years. It needs to stretch how long? 430 years to the self-same day. <laughs> Actually, 430 years to the day from the time Levi left to the time his, what would it be, great-grandchildren uh, come out. Now, I knew my great-grandfather. Many of you did, too. You didn't know my great-grandfather, but many of you knew your great-grandfather. And uh, I, 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 when I was a child, I remember we'd go to Grandma's house in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and uh, great-grandpa would often be there for a time. He uh, lived with them in his older years. He lived well into his uh, 90s, I believe about 94, if I'm not uh, mistaken. His name was Frank W. Garber. And uh, he, he founded the Cheyenne Brethren Church in Cheyenne, Wyoming. And uh, he was the uh, pastor of the church. It started in his home and built, and the church uh, uh, is still there. But that was my great-grandfather. Now, he was born, I should have looked this up, I don't know, somewhere in the 1800s he was born, and uh, it, it would be, you know, we could get that out to 200 years maybe uh, by the time uh, he was born to the time I'm 80 years, you know, it'll stretch into 200, 215, 30, 40 years in there, but guess what? There's no way, even if I live a very long time, we'll stretch that into 400 years, will we? It just doesn't work. And God says, from when they go down there to when they come back, there's going to be how many generations? Four. Four. We got them right here. You can add them up. Now, how in the world do you make this work? Well, uh, you make it work again by uh, reading, uh, honestly, uh, reading very literally. Uh, in fact, uh, now let's look at one more New Testament passage. Let's go to Galatians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. It's in the uh, New Testament. And here is, I think, the key to the answer of how long were they there. Galatians 3, beginning in uh, verse 16. It says... Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not to seeds as of many, but to one, the seed which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant which was confirmed before, uh, before God in Christ, the law, which was, how many years later? 430 years later cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Now, here's, here's the point, if you didn't understand that. He says, God gave to Abraham a covenant. It was the covenant of land that we talked about uh, last week or two weeks ago. Uh, and it, this covenant was given to him, according to Galatians and many other places, it was given to him by promise. Remember, we said it was a one-sided covenant. It was a promise of God. And then Paul in the book of Galatians says that 400 and how many years later? 430 years later, he gave a different covenant. And the, the, the covenant that he gave 430 years later in the book of Galatians happens to be the covenant of the law. Does anybody remember when the law was given to the nation of Israel? Or where? Uh, on the mountain, that's right, Mount Sinai. And Mount Sinai took place, we'll look at this uh, next week, but it took place uh, uh, 50 days after Passover, and Passover was when they left Egypt, right? So they leave Egypt, 50 days later, they get the law. And they got the law, and it's 430 years, right? From what? From the promise confirmed to Abraham. Now, you uh, put all of this together in uh, such a way that you see the scripture actually is very precise in everything that it says. And uh, so what we know is that uh, from the uh, birth of Isaac to the death of Jacob, and Jacob, of course, died in, uh, in, in, in uh, Egypt, there was 215 years. And so we can account for 215 years of 430. And so all we have to do is subtraction. If you can't do that, I'll help you because I have a calculator. <laughs> and you end up with 430 years. So the question then 
<laughs> if you want to uh, uh, pretend you know like your, your, your Bible, when I say, how long were the children of Israel in Egypt? How long were they there? 215 years is how long they were there. Now, how long were the children of Is Israel sojourning, waiting to get the land? 430 years. Plus, by the way, then if you want to uh, use your newer uh, translation, plus they had 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, and then they had, uh, and then they went in. So it's about 450 years, honestly, as you as you work that out. It all works out uh, in, any way you do it, and so it comes out very well. But so you, we, we've got them 215 years in uh, in the land of Egypt. Now, uh, to 430 years sojourning, 215 years in the land of Egypt. That explains something that uh, has intrigued you, no doubt, uh, along the way. And that is a key feature of Exodus chapter 1, where I told you to turn at the very beginning of the sermon, and now finally I am there. Exodus chapter 1, I want you to notice uh, something. Let's look, for example, in uh, verse 7, it says, the children of Israel were what? They were fruitful. That means uh, pears and apples and cherries, right? <laughs> means they were what? Having babies. They were fruitful. Not only does it say this, and in, in, in verse 7, it says, they were fruitful and increased abundantly. And what? Multiplied. And what? Waxed exceedingly mighty. And what? The land was filled with them. Now, do you get the sense, again, if you're not reading this devotionally, but you're reading it very closely because you believe God gave us every word, look at what he says. They were fruitful, they increased, they were multiplied, they waxed exceedingly mighty, the land was filled with them five times in one verse. Here's what he's saying. They went down there and they had babies and more babies and more babies and babies like you had never seen before. They were having babies like rabbits. That's what verse uh, 7 is saying. Now, go on and uh, let's look, for example, in verse 10, three verses later. Come on, let us deal wisely with them. This is the Pharaoh speaking. Lest they, what? Multiply. And it come to pass that when there falleth out uh, a war, they join up with our enemies and fight us against us and, and to drive us out of the land. So Pharaoh is looking at this and saying, you know what? I got this group of people that's living down here and they are fruitful. They are increasing abundantly. They are multiplying. They are waxing exceedingly mighty. The land is being filled with them and he's got a population crisis. Now go from there to uh, verse 12. It says, but the more they afflicted them, that's with the, uh, the taskmasters, the more they afflicted them, the more they what? Multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. That is, the, the uh, Egyptians were grieved. Why? Because this unbelievable baby boom is happening. Now, you can uh, uh, go down uh, actually to uh, verse 19, and uh, here's the midwives. And the midwives, in verse 19, said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively. <laughs> And are delivered ere the midwives come into them. What do the midwives say? I'm, I'm convinced the midwives here aren't lying. The midwives are saying, these people have babies fast. Well, it's not like you Egyptians, you know, maybe you're in labor 20 hours or whatever. I mean, these girls, they're out working in the field. They start having labor. They lay down, have a baby, put them on the back, and, and keep going. And uh, they're having unbelievable babies. Now, when you read Exodus chapter 1, I would challenge you to read it in any other way. What Exodus chapter 1 is saying is, you can't believe how many babies these people are having. That's the whole point of Exodus chapter 1. I mean, why this silly little midwife story, right? Because it is some evidence to the fact that they are having babies. Unbelievable amount of babies. Maybe even like Nathan and Katrina Britton. Uh, <laughs> yes. Somebody make sure they get this part of the sermon. Now, 
this, this, this is the point here. Now, that expo- we, we have it explained. Now, how do you get from 75 people to later on, there's going to be one count of the men, which is going to be 600,000. There's only one way in 250 years you go from 75 to 600,000. And that's only the fighting men, by the way. How do you do it? You better have lots of babies. And that's what Exodus chapter 1 is about. Well, it uh, tells us in Exodus chapter 2 then that uh, there, there, there went a man from the house of Levi, took, uh, uh, t- took a wife of the daughter of Levi. We happen to know his name's Amram. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him, that he was what? Beautiful is what many say. King James says a goodly child. She hid him three months. Now, have any of you ever uh, seen an ugly baby? <laughs> Please don't answer out loud. You, you haven't seen your own ugly baby, though, have you? If it's your baby, your baby is beautiful. Most beautiful baby ever born. I, they, 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 what's that old saying? A face only a mother could love? <laughs> and our mother loves that child. I mean, every mother believes their child is beautiful. And yet here's one who comes along and says, my child is beautiful or goodly. I I, I wish uh, we had uh, plenty of time. We would go through uh, some of these verses. And uh, I I just, I do want you to uh, jump to uh, Hebrews, the 11th chapter, and uh, see what we've got about this goodly or beautiful child that is uh, given. And there are uh, three, maybe four times in the Bible where it tells us that this child was beautiful depending on how you translate the word. And we see it in uh, Hebrews chapter 11, which is known as the Hall of Faith. And in chapter 11, beginning in verse uh, 23, there's this long section down to really verse uh, 29 that talks about Moses in, in this chapter. And here it says, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw that he was what? Uh, King James says proper. What's the other say? He, he was no ordinary child. He was, did someone say beautiful? It does. Okay, that's what I thought. So here's, a, uh, when, whenever you have a word that has a, a wide variance of English translations, that means you better stop and study this word a little bit. Is he proper? Is he no ordinary child? Is he beautiful? Beautiful comes up in the book of Acts. Beautiful comes up uh, in uh, many of the translations in Exodus, as we've seen. There's something about this baby that is unique. The, the, the word there actually that is uh, given there, uh, asietos, I believe it is, uh, the, the word really means uh, uh, he's, uh, I'm I'm just going to give you the best way I can. He's a city boy. She looked at this Hebrew boy and said, this is a city boy. This is, I I went down to Florida a number of weeks ago. You know, my daughter and son-in-law live down there. And uh, I uh, I, I made a joke one time. It's really not that much of a joke because they live in in, in the area of West Palm Beach. And so my joke was, everyone says, well, you all live down here where the pretty people live, right? You've, you've heard people talk, you know, the city people, you know, they're all dressed up and clean and polished and all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, it's the pretty people. Well, they looked at, at Moses and said, this is a pretty boy. This is a guy that's going somewhere. Now, remember that back in the beginning in Genesis chapter 315, God gave a promise, didn't he? And the promise had to do with what? A baby was going to be born of a woman who had crushed the serpent on the head. And this is what every Hebrew woman was looking for every time a baby was born. I I think that this is one of the reasons why they're having so many babies, by the way. Because they're saying, we're here in slavery. We've been promised a land and and a a theocracy, if you will. And that's only going to come about when the serpent is crushed and the serpent is alive and well today. Let's have babies. Let's see if we can bring this about. And so this is what they're doing. And so uh, Jochebed, uh, Amram's wife, Moses' mother, somehow looks at this child, and I'm convinced she, by faith, puts him in the, in the river saying, this might be our redeemer. 
This might be the one who saves us. That's so much the story, as I've told you before, that's the story of the Old Testament. Is it this child or this child or this child or this child? Is it Moses or Joshua or Samson or what? Is it this one? And so here uh, it, it again comes in Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, and verse 3 says uh, that, uh, that uh, mine pronounces he was a proper child. That is, he's a, he's a city boy. He's all cleaned up and spiffy. Uh, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he was come of years. Does anyone say anything besides come of years, by the way? When he was of age? When he had grown up? Okay. Maybe that's what that means. But the word that is used in Greek is mega. Mega. You know that word mega, don't you? And the devil someday is going to be chained up in a mega chain. Is that a chain that has come of age? No, it's a big chain. It's a great chain. There, it's an interpretation that say he came of years. That is, he was, not the, he was not a minor anymore. He was of the years of his majority. He was 18 or whatever that, that was uh, then. But there's a real sense, I think probably even more, when that's an interpretation. And the translation literally is that he, 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 uh, he had become great. That's what it says if you're reading Greek. Came to the point where he had become great. Now, Moses, if you watch the movie, you remember that he was raised in the palace and he became the Pharaoh's uh, the son. He was the prince of Egypt, right? That's great, isn't it? It's mega. Here's a, here's a mega man among all the Hebrews. So I'm going to take it more literally. When Moses had, ha, had uh, grown to the point of greatness. There's some interesting things in Josephus, by the way, that talk about the, uh, the, the conquests of Moses and the things that he did as a prince of Egypt. So here he was, really a great warrior prince of Egypt. Even Egypt is looking for him. And it says, he refused to be called the Pharaoh's daughter. That's awfully big when you're going to inherit the throne. To, uh, to, to literally, the word can be translated, refused there, can, can be translated disowned. He disowned his family, his uh, Egyptian family, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect upon the recompense of the world. I, I like that. He esteemed the reproach of Christ to be greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. I can have the treasures of Egypt, but he says, I'd rather have the reproach of Christ. Now you look at that and say, how in the world does Moses, who lives uh, 1,500 years before Christ, care anything about the reproach of Christ? Remember, Christ is just the word for Messiah. And he says, for Messiah's sake, who hadn't come, but he's coming, I give up all of the treasures of Egypt, and I'm going to go with my people and my coming Redeemer. And, of course, you know the story how God uh, raised him up, and then he went into the uh, wilderness for those 40 years. And it's this man, Moses, who, by faith, that mother looks into that, uh, that baby and says, there's something different about this child. Maybe this is the one places him in a river. He's, he's uh, captured, if you will, by the Pharaoh's daughter. He grows up to be great and mighty in Egypt, but then he turns his back on all of that. He walks out into the wilderness, runs out into the wilderness, if you read the story, and there he is on the backside of the wilderness for 40 years. And God's teaching him something while he's out there, isn't he? Like, how do you survive in this place? And Moses learned this is how you survive. This is how you get from here to there. This is what you do. Forty years of training he had there. Forty years in, in leadership school. Forty years in wilderness training. And after that 80 years, God says, Moses, get up and go back. Face the Pharaoh and say, let my people go. Can you count that? Let my people go. Four words. You remember what Moses' response was? Uh, uh, I'm not a good speaker. <laughs> Only one of those words even has two syllables. <laughs> Let my people go. That's what you got to do. And uh, he was a little, you know, Freddy pants over the whole thing. You remember the story, how it goes. I think I probably would have been too. 
And yet God uses him to bring those people out of Egypt. God working all along because he had given a promise to Abraham saying, they're going to be 400 uh, years from the time of the confirmation, which was 30 years after. So there's going to be a total of 430 years that's out there. And from the time they go there until the time they come back, there's going to be four, four generations. And God's up there saying, I've been counting, I've been watching, I've been sitting back, and now is the time. And he stirs the heart of Jochebed to say, put your baby in a basket. Let's save this child. And he uses them. And it's because of Moses, not only were the children of Israel freed, but because of Moses, you and I have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He blesses us to this day. That was that Egypt experience. Let's pray together. 